But, uh, okay, thank you very much for the kind invitation to Professor Marincora and uh, to the, all the BICON staff, especially for the president, Dr. Morgan, and uh, my thanks to all the BICON people for his support, the, for the support they gave me in the, this year. And uh, before, but before beginning, I would like to thank two persons. The first is my director, Professor Nocini, who allowed me to uh, do part of the research uh, which uh, uh, results I am discussing with you, I'm sharing with you. And uh, the other person uh, that I would like to thank is uh, uh, Professor De Porter. Where are you? <laughs> How are you, Professor? <laughs> because. Professor De Porter was the one who opened my mind at the, some days ago, opened my mind, and uh, probably without him, I should not have, uh, have had the capacity to understand the meaning and the, the secret of the Bicon implant. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, well, I think that uh, I can start my presentation. Okay, I take the opportunity to, to thank Leonardo for hosting us here in, in Ferrara. I didn't know how much be how beautiful is this town. And uh, sorry, no. okay. 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 And finally, I would like to thank all the boy, all the my boy who work with me in university, and without them, I could not be here to share anything with you. So we know that. Uh, sorry, echo. We know that. Uh, for many here, dentists and the oral surgeon have aimed for the placement of the longest possible implant in any given site. Uh, despite the fact that this could be could put a risk, neighboring vital structure, overheating bone, crested bone, and uh, uh, inviting underlying nerves. So. From the meta-analysis meta of the literature, we know that with machine surface implant, we can have a, a community survival rate after five years of 95%. And when the, when the rough surface implant replaced the smooth surface implant, the uh, cumulative survival rate rose to 97% after five years. But unfortunately, in many cases, we don't have such abundant uh, bone volume. And so, augmentation procedure have been proposed in literature and uh, to allow the placement of long implant, the guided bone regeneration and the internal sinus lift, uh, lift by osteotomes with osteotomes is uh, some example of, them, of those. Guided bone regeneration, we know, is a procedure based on the use of membrane. It's, uh, not, uh, it's not an easy procedure, it's very demanding. It's very demanding for uh, the patient and the needs a uh, very skilled and uh, expert surgeon to be performed. And if we look to the uh, survival rate, we see that in literature, literature, the cumulative survival rate is quite high for some authors, not so high for other authors, but for all the authors. If we look at the patient satisfaction, the, cumul the cumulative success rate, it did not mean survival rate, but success rate, the clinical success, success is not quite high. And this, you, and this is due 
without any doubt to the high incidence of the premature exposure of the membrane, with all the consequences and the complications from the clinical aesthetic point of view that uh, this brings. On the other side, the bacilla, internal sinus elevation is considered a simpler, simpler uh, procedure, but nevertheless, this procedure requires a certain level of uh, expertise. And uh, it's not necessarily, necessarily result in 100% of success. So, this is the bone augmentation procedure, procedure and uh, even, even if uh, carried out by an expert dental surgeon, the optimal four results are not always achieved with this procedure. And uh, we must remember that they are very demanding from the point of view of the patient. Given this situation, the use of short implants has been proposed in such cases in the past. Can be this a realistic alternative? Some researchers raised many doubts at the beginning because they thought that short implants couldn't work. The controversy rose because in the first experimental studies, the, uh, the uh, only uh, machine surface, smooth surface, have been used. And uh, uh, machine surface implant uh, failed to give long-term good results. But when rough surface implant replaced as short implant, the machine surface implants, the results will be uh, where the results were completely different. So the skepticism towards shoulder implant uh, was par partially overcome in the last decades, at least for what regards seven and eight millimeter length implant. And uh, if we look the results of the literature, this, we see how the success of this procedure can be compared very well with the results that we achieve with the augmentation procedure. In my own experience, my own personal experience, accords with the literature, literature using Bicon 8mm implants with similar results being achieved with 8mm implants. We, we can see that there is no doubt that we can use uh, these implants with a high degree of reliability. <coughs> but remind the questions of whether alveolar ridge of less than seven millimeter can be effectively treated with implants shorter than seven millimeter. Sorry. This is a, a, no, a, 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 a no way infrequent uh, situation. We found this situation in the 62% of the maxillary, maxillary posterior ridge and in the 50% of the posterior mandible we find less than millimeter height right reach. When a vertical bone augmentation of more than four millimeter has been attempted in conjunction with the uh, long implant placement, uh, literature told us that the uh, survival rate decreased. So, this is not a trustable solution to try to raise the membrane of more than three, four millimeter. Or at least it's not 
a solution that works in the hand of the majority of us, or at least in my hand. Literature, in this case, suggests to use the sinus lift with a lateral approach. This is a well-known, very proven technique. With polished surface implant, the, la the cumulative survival rate achievable is 91.2% after, after five years. And with the rust surface implant, the cumulative survival rate rose to 96%. But even if this procedure may be effective, uh, there are many, for, for the literature, uh, for our daily practice, uh, we know that uh, some complication can follow or can uh, rise after or during this uh, procedure. For example, the most frequent is uh, the perforation of the sinus membrane, but the most dangerous uh, is uh, the infection of the graft with the uh, comes with the following uh, uh, purulent sinusitis. And even if everything goes well, this procedure requires three interventions and uh, over a period of nine months or even more. In such, in such a situation, would it not better to be better to use implants of five to six millimeter in length? Well, this is uh, now uh, begin the topic of my discussion because uh, I am here uh, with the to share with you the results uh, we obtained in the School of Dentistry of Verona uh, the, in uh, uh, about 301 bicon implant placed in maxilla and in mandible, short and ultra short bicon implant. In posterior maxilla, now I show you some cases, of course not such cases, uh, uh, such wonderful cases uh, as uh, the, those uh, we have seen before of Dr. Koenig. Uh, I am a periodontist, so I am I, I'm feeling more confident uh, when I have uh, not to do big surgery. So this is what uh, exactly you can do. Everybody of us can achieve uh, in our daily practice with this uh, kind of implant. So let's see. The, oops. Because this is Windows 8, and okay, okay. Now uh, the, the the presentation will be focused to check how stable is the uh, bone level are the bone levels around this implant following during the time. You can see that this is the loading. This is the situation after one year, and this is the situation after three years. There are very, very few change, changes. I, we calculated that the average uh, uh, reception uh, of the first bone contact point is uh, after three years of 0 0.2 millimeters with this implant. So very, very few, almost uh, difficult to, uh, to check. Another case, as you can see, this is work done in university with the limitation of the fingerprints of the students, but we can follow the pet to the guilty. So no resorption of the bone, another, five millimeter implants, this is the loading, and this is what we have after three years. This is not, and not something special at all. I'm just showing you what you have, in, what we find, what you see every day in your clinics. After three years, this is the situation. 
and I can go home for all the day like you could do. Because this is not the surgeon here who, do, who does the great part of the job, but is the design of the implant. Very stable, without any morbidity for the patient. The patients are happy and they finally when they smile to me, they really smile to me, not like before when I perform more compli performed more complicated and invasive procedure. Another case, the loading, the position of the bone at the moment of the loading, and this is after one year, and this is what we have after three years. And this is a case that I, I like to show. The, I'm, this is one of the first cases, so I made some errors. And I always, I, at that time, I thought that the bigger is better, no? Longer is better. So the consequence is that I lose, I lost the implant. But uh, look what happened with this kind of implant. I waited. This is what happened after six months. This is what happened after 12 months, and this is what I found after 60 months. <laughs> so, I, I, I can, how can I say, the spare tires, spare tires that can fix the problem, the four, the four, four, five implants, I placed the four, four, five implants, and now the patient is happy and confident with me, in me. So, we wonder, there is, a, is this a, a realistic alternative to the sinus grafting? From my experience, yes. This is the cumulative survival rate after uh, three, almost four years of follow-up with this kind of procedure. In the literature, there are articles that compare uh, five, six millimeter with the seven, eight millimeter, and we see that the results that we achieved are comparable with those of the seven, eight millimeter implants present in literature. And in my experience, both implants, five millimeter and six millimeter, show it to be very reliable. So, short, neutral short. Hello, so this is the problem with the, the changing of computer. <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, you will do the best to read what is effectively is difficult to read. But is the meaning is that you can trust on this implant when you have all at least five millimeter of natural bone. For the, from the results I obtain. But what approach can be taken when the alveolar ridge is less than five millimeter height? Ultra short implant in conjunction with internal sinus lift can be a valid alternative to the lateral approach, even if when the ridge is less than five millimeter, i.e. For example, three millimeter. Let's see what just an explicative case. This is the situation. This is the procedure to place uh, with. I, I just use the, uh, the the internal sinus lift abutment, and uh, with the syntograft, I place. Uh, I create uh, my sinus lift, uh, internal sinus lift elevation of the membrane, and I place the. The implant and the follow, and I follow the implant, the process of uh, healing of the implant, and this is what I found after one year of loading. <coughs> and this is what I found after four years of loading. Very stable results, confirmed from the 
do you see a eh? from the tomography? So this is the principle of the internal sinus lift elevation, but you know, everybody knows what, is, what I'm talking. But let me show some cases. This is uh, the beginning, the, the baseline, this is the implant placement, and this is uh, the loading, and this is what we have after free gifts. This is not, not a spe something special. This is the implant placement. This is the loading. And this is what we have after the three years. This is the preoperative picture. This is the implant placement. This is the loading. And this is what we have <coughs> after three years. So, are a reliable, is a reliable procedure to perform an internal sinus lift in conjunction with uh, ultra short implants in case of uh, severely resorbed reach? From my own experience, yes. It seems to me a valid, valid, valid and effective procedure. And the no statistical difference uh, has been found between uh, whether the use of 5 mm or 6 mm implant. In literature, there are very few, very few papers uh, dealing with the topics uh, of the internal sinus lift uh, with the uh, ultra short bicon implant. I found one and uh, after a follow-up of two years, the authors found a community survival rate of 100% with this kind of procedure in an average ridge of 3 mm. My experience compared very well. I was surprised, but uh, uh, I didn't... Uh, uh, I, I, I didn't, uh, I was surprised that uh, I don't have the 100%, but because 100% uh, is something that sounds strange to me every, in all the activity of the human being. So, but follow up, after three years, I had a follow up of, uh, of the three years of follow up, my, my results was a community survival rate of 98%, very good result. So, may the use of 5-6 mm length bicon implant in association with an internal sinus lift be a valid alternative to the lateral approach? In my opinion, for me, definitely yes. Let's move now to the mandible. What can we do if the ridge offers only 5-6 to six mm? In literature, vertical right augmentation will be proposed like, for example, the graft from the chin, from the, from the ramus. And uh, the community survival rate with this procedure after a few years is 94%. But the problem is not that it is a very demanding for the patient uh, procedure that uh, requires a very skilled and very expert surgeon. Is, uh, as, uh, uh, the, very prob the real problem is that uh, the graft undergo progressively address to a big, big resorption. And uh, you can see dur during the, you can see watching the, the, looking at the picture, how the graft, the greatest part, uh, is resorbed. Another case, just to follow the fate of the grafted bone during the time. One year after loading, five years after loading, 10 years after loading. And this is not something that uh, happened to me. It happens to the majority of the surgeon because it not depends from the surgeon, but depends from the type of vascularization on the posterior mandible and the presence of a thick cortical bone. But on the hand, what we, what we found that okay, implants survive thanks to five millimeter height available in the native bone. So at the end, they become short implants, but not with the right design for, to be, for being a ultra short implant. So could we use implants of 
five or six millimeters without any graft at all. Let's, for, let's see some cases. Implant placement, loading. After three years, another case. Preparative, implant placement, loading. <coughs> After three years, loading. After one year, after three years. First two implant placed, loaded the, the first two implants, another implant placed, the third implant loaded, after three years. <coughs> implant placement, Loading, six months. I, something happened. I really, I don't know what's happened, but uh, I lost this implant. But look with this implant, what can we do? 12 months after, the bone was healed, and so I placed another implant, just like everybody of us do. And, uh, I could, after restore this uh, uh, implant, with the total, complete uh, satisfaction, satisfaction for the patient, and with no problem for me. So this is a, a, a trustable solution to use five six millimeter length implant, a bicon like six meter, six, uh, five six millimeter length implants in a very resorbed region, the posterior mandible. Yes. With the 97% of the scoliotic survival rate, I think that yes, this is a very good procedure with the 98% with 6 mm and the 96% with 5 mm scoliotic survival rate with no statistical difference between the two kind of implant. Reliable results have been achieved with both the 6 and the 5 mm implants. In the literature, we found that the cumulative survival rate found for this kind of implant is quite high, 98%, but only after one year of follow-up. Our results uh, are comprehensive of the results uh, during a period of three, follow three years of follow-up, follow and the cumulative the results we obtained are quite uh, satisfaction for me. So, the results with, uh, after this experience of 301 short and ultra short bicon implant is that the community survival rate is high, comparable with those reported in literature with for long implants after three years. The community survival rate is similar for maxilla and for mandible. In maxilla, I lost five out of 139 implant. But no statistical significant differences between classes of implant lengths has, have been found as regard the survival rates. Similarly, in the mandible, the cumulative survival rate was 97% and no statistical difference was found among the various classes of implant lengths. Now let's go to the topic of the health status of this implant. I found the, the real majority of this implant in a completely status of health. They were healthy. Only 2% of resorption of bone, the only 8% of inflammation of soft tissue around this implant. The 90% of the implant after three years the 90% of these short and ultra short implants are healthy. If we look to eventually present the, the, the eventual, eventual presence of some difference between maxilla and between, um, uh, between maxilla and mandible, I found that 
uh, in Mandible, there it seems to be uh, a little more uh, <coughs> prevalence of biological problems. But the majority of problem is uh, related to the presence of inflammation of the soft tissue. So, if we uh, go, if we go for a, to, to, if we try to find what uh, are the predictor for mucositis with this kind of implant, I found that there are more, prob more, more probability to find uh, mucositis uh, in uh, implant placed in the mandible, mandible, and when the material for the prosthetic reconstruction is uh, uh, in resin uh, and not in ceramic. But we are talking of inflammation of soft tissue. We are not talking of implantitis. We are not talking of loss of bone. Because if we go for, try to check if we have some predictor for risk, I, can't do, they, I found only the 3% of preimplantitis, and in literature, the, percent, the prevalence range from uh, 18 after five years to 51 or more after nine, 10 years. So I found something strange, but uh, real. No present, too few preimplantitis to find any correlation. What if, if I have a time, a little time more, I would address a new topic, but for me very interesting, because with this kind of implant, uh, yes, it's important to know that we have a, few, uh, a, 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 a little, a low percent prevalence of preimplantitis, but uh, it's, uh, for me, the, the similar importance is to know that with the simpler we can treat peripatitis. Uh, and not, as I said, because we are the greatest surgeon and the greatest periodontist in the world. No, but just because of this unique and particular and special designs who allow us to place this implant routinely two or three millimeters under the level of the crest. Because with other implants, when the preimplantitis takes place, there is the absorption of the bone, and the implant that have been placed at the level of the crest, after the preimplantitis, protrude, will protrude over the bone. With this implant, that have been placed under the level of the crest, we will find uh, an intrabony defect. And we know that the, that the, the, intrabony, the intrabony defect is the defect with the greatest chances for regenerate. So what we have to do is to run for a deep, uh, complete, thoroughly disinfection and the debridement, uh, the, the debridement of the, effect, the defect, the disinfection of the uh, implant, the surface <coughs> implant. And after we fill the material, I filled, I f yes, the, what, I, what I did is to fill the, the gra the, to graft the defect. And to, I tried to achieve a very good suture to achieve a primary intention closure that is very, very important. Very, very important to every generation. And so what I had to do is to wait. And this is what I found after two years. <coughs> Before, after. before and after. Another case, deep pocket, bleeding on probing, 
intraborny defect uh, at, the, at the Higgs ray. In this case, the patient allowed us to remove the prosthesis. Not, the, not always uh, the patients are happy that if we remove the prosthesis. This is the defect uh, once uh, rise the flap. The same procedure to the, to, for the, the brightening of the defect, and for the disinfection of the implant surface, and after the, graft, the grafting of the defect. And the uh, suture for primary intention. And this is what we have, what we found after two years. Before, after two years. Before, after two years. Another case, I have, uh, now I reached the, uh, I think, 11th cases and I'm going to publish, I hope, if I find the strengths and the, the, the time, but I think that this is a topic that deserves to be, to be, uh, to be known for the, from the dentists, because it seems that this protocol really works. Uh, another case, a defect, intrabony defect, the pocket bleeding on problem, the intrabony defect. We, with this implant, I repeat, we have intrabony defect. What we have to do in this situation is to clean, to, uh, and uh, to try to have the much sterilization, if we can reach, but disinfection at least of the surface of the implant. And after, we graft the implant and suture and after to wait. And this is what we had. We had after two years. So, conclusion. David de and Frank Renoir in 2014 uh, wrote that short length implants can be successfully used to support single and mul multiple fixed reconstruction. And they wish that additional studies should also investigate to uh, answer the question if uh, there is, is there a real possibility of using uh, ultra short implants uh, in the extremely resorbed posterior jaw. Okay. And from the results of my research for this preliminary data, okay. my answer is that definitely, yes, we can. Thank you very much for your kind attention.